from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Hello and welcome to Middle East Focus, a weekly podcast on regional affairs and U.S. policy produced by the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C. You can subscribe to Middle East Focus on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to get your podcasts. I'm Intisar Fakir, a senior fellow at MEI and the director of its North Africa and Sahel program. On today's episode, we will be talking about Tunisia's economic challenges, the country's heavy debt burden, its relationship with international financial institutions, the fraught political context in which these economic crises are playing out, and the impact on citizens. To help me make sense of the myriad issues, we have two fantastic guests for you. Marwa Haddar, a strategy and finance specialist with a focus on corporate and project finance, financial restructuring, and strategic vision service in emerging markets and developing countries. Marwa is a vice president for finance and strategy at Blue Monsoon Capital in Singapore. And Fadl Ali Rida. Fadl is a non-resident fellow at MEI's North Africa and Sahel program. He is also the founder and editor-in-chief of Meshkel.org, an independent Tunisia-focused publication produced in Arabic and English. Thank you both for joining me today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Before I start with specific questions, let me provide some numbers that I think will help us get a sense of where Tunisia's economy is and why there is such concern about it. According to World Bank figures, GDP contracted by 9.2% in 2020, an employment increased from 15% prior to the pandemic to now reaching between 16.1% by the first quarter of 2022. The fiscal deficit and public debt have both increased. The fiscal deficit reached about 11.5% of GDP in 2020 as reserves fell because of a lower tax intake. And the rise in fiscal deficit also led to an increase in government debt. Debt in relation to GDP has reached roughly 90%. Tunisia's central bank raised its interest rates in May to keep inflation under control. By April, inflation had reached 7.5%. As the Tunisian people struggle with high commodity prices and high food costs and even food unavailability. At the same time, opposition to Qais Saeed's continuing power grab is growing, and so is opposition to his transition plans as they become more and more clear. So let's start there, the political context and its implication on the economic outlook. Fadl. The judges' union have recently organized strikes, and so have the UJTT. Presumably, this is to push back against Qais Saeed's effort to bring whatever remains of the judiciary under his control. Can you talk us through what the political scene is right now and link that to where the country is economically? Sure. I think it's maybe interesting to try and locate where opposition to Qais Saeed is coming from, or at least effective opposition. We've seen political parties up until this point. It seems they haven't been particularly effective at playing an opposition role. And that's partly because they're divided. I mean, we see different groups, different blocks of parties that aren't necessarily working together. But at the same time, they are still, I think, relatively unpopular. But maybe more interestingly, as you mentioned, are these sort of strikes that we're seeing, particularly from the judges and from the UGT. So the judges union, this is, I think, particularly key because there had been one judges union out of sort of the four major ones that had sort of been on Kai Syed's side back in, in February when he had replaced the higher judicial council. But now we're seeing that even they have, have really unified with the association of Tunisian judges in really saying that they need to, to unite to sort of push back. And we've seen the courts basically on strike only really sort of clerking work that's happening there. At the same time, usually today, it's more important to sort of look at it because it just has more power. It has more capacity to, to mobilize people. It's really nationally representative. And, you know, the fact that they're striking, I think it's a sign that not only is strikes really the only avenue left that may be effective opposition, but really that is the main power that these institutions have to play as opposition role in the country. As for usually today, what are they thinking? I think it's not primarily worried necessarily about Kaisaid's new constitutional projects 
per se, but about a general trend, I think, of the presidency trying to undercut them. And we recently just heard news that Bijoutete has told press that they believe they're being targeted directly by the president. There is the circulaire, like an executive administrative order, number 20 from December last year, which said that basically negotiations between the UGTT and the ministries have to get approval in advance from the prime minister's office, which is really a centralization of power that the UGTT sees as a step back for them. But also the fact that Haisai doesn't seem to be really taking the UGTT as seriously as I think the UGTT would like. And the final angle, uh, angle of this is really the IMF. I think that the strike for June 16th not only to demonstrate the UGTA's power and how serious they are and that the Kaisai needs to take them seriously, but also to, to demonstrate to the IMF and to the private sector more broadly that you know if there are going to be cuts that are going to hurt the UGTA's constituency in particular, but also to Asians in general, then the UGTA is going to be the institution that's, that's really going to really try and stop that. I mean, UGT has a history of national liberation that predates Tunisia's independence. So they see themselves as really a key institution and a buffer, I think, to some of the excesses of the exploitation of Tunisian workers, whether that's from foreign investors or international markets. But usually it has, has really been a buffer for keeping those terms from collapsing completely to the detriment of Tunisian workers more broadly. Marwa, I think this is a great point for you to pick up and just kind of talk us a little bit through about how much of the UGTT's posturing is about economic demands, as as Fadl has mentioned. We know that, again, that any IMF deal is going to involve cuts to the wage bill, potential freeze of the wage bill. So please explain what the Tunisian government's proposal to the IMF is right now. Where does the IMF negotiation stand? And what kind of impact that's going to have on Egypt today, their constituents, and Tunisia's economy more broadly? Thank you, Antisar, and further for the points you, you raised. I think the question about the IMF deal terms and the Tunisian government proposal can take us days to go through its details. But to start this discussion, let's discuss some principles here. I think this government has the sort of democracy hanging over its head. First, Tunisia needs to deal with its lenders. Otherwise, it risks causing the economy to stall. And this deal needs to be practical, realistic, and quote-unquote sellable to the lenders. But it has also to appeal to the government's constituencies that are, at the end, the Tunisian citizens. And like Father said, their representation by the UGTT. Because if people are not happy today in Tunisia, they will protest also against this government. And if they are still patient up to... Today, it is not because this government is competent. It is just because the former governments were disastrous. Tunisia stands today in a dire position regarding its debt today, to me. External debt was at more than 100% of GDP in 2020. The external debt service in 2020 was around 3.3 billion. That is around 90% of total debt. And it also shows that it's not stretch out. It shows how badly we negotiated our terms before. And we all know how hard the last two years were on world's economies, like you mentioned, Antisar, earlier. Pandemic, the wars, the disruptions in supply chains, food insecurities, and so on and so forth. The projected payment to the IMF, for example, will more than double in 2023 compared to 2022. And debt amortization will even grow further in 2024. So the next two years, 2023 and 2024, would be really, financially speaking, hard if this government changes nothing. And what is the role of the government here? I think it is to build consensus, including with the UGTT. One can say it is normal that they are posturing, but what is the government doing about it? And I think Fadel explained well, how Qaisai is dealing with them and how is usually the perception of how Qaisai is dealing with them. And I think the tensions and the posturing are more about political matters rather than the economic outlook of Tunisia. I mean, Ujetete and others, they need a vision. They need to know where the institutional and political setup is going and how it will be There is ambiguity, and this ambiguity has a huge cost. 
such as what we are seeing now on the Tunisian scene. Marwa, I want to get back to all of that and what the lack of political consensus means moving forward. But first, Fadl, I want to come back to you for a little bit of a sort of an overview of how Tunisia came to this point, to this sort of vicious cycle where the country has to borrow to pay off its growing debt while economic output continues to be limited. And particularly, I want you to touch on something that Marwa said which is how poorly Tunisia has negotiated previous deals with financial institutions. Thank you. Yeah, I I think there's sort of a a short story here and a long story. I think the short story is, I mean, yes, the the, the terms of the the lending, particularly, you know, the the lending at all, was it even necessary? I think there was a very big question mark about the IMF loan in 2013, whether it was necessary. Of course, when you compare those macroeconomic indicators that you mentioned at the beginning of the session, basically, and you look at them compared to 2013, actually 2013, things were, were quite fine. That to GDP ratio was about 40%. Unemployment was about the same as it is today. It has not really improved, but we do see that there was you know, very serious inflation, particularly after the 2016 IMF deal, where we saw, most importantly, one of the key conditions was central bank independence. Another way to look at that is actually that monetary policy is no longer has any democratic checks to it, and that that really saw a depreciation, that there was a depreciation of the currency, ostensibly to improve the trade deficit by making Tunisian exports more attractive, but it also made imports more expensive. And so much of what Tunisia exports requires imported inputs, raw materials, or capital goods, or, or component parts, which all got more expensive. And I think That's sort of the bigger picture of the debt crisis, which is that Tunisia is really slotted into globalization in an extremely precarious way, where it's almost entirely dependent on the EU, with obviously very little corresponding power over the EU. One other sort of aspect of the short-term story is, of course, Deauville, after the 2011 revolution, there was sort of an opportunity where maybe the debts of the Ben Ali regime, particularly loans that were used oftentimes to prop up his family and people who were close to the Ben Ali regime, you know, there was a moment for sort of canceling that as odious debt, but that was really shut down quickly. And instead, what happened was that there was a new round of lending with Dovin. And so now we see that the debt is, is in many ways unsustainable. But to, to go back just a little bit to the longer story is that, you know, Tunisia has been producing less and less to meet domestic needs because instead it has been producing for Europe at, you know, really at an exploitative scale. And by that, I mean the, the value of Tunisian clothes car parts, food in France and Italy, you know, Tunisia is not in a place to really set the terms of those products. And if you meet the Tunisians who pick olives for Italian branded olive oil bottles or the Tunisians making the jeans that, you know, French people wear, you'll see that they're really living in awful conditions, whether that's nutrition, health, mental, and and it hasn't gotten better uh, over the last several decades, despite the fact that that's really where the state has invested in, in this export led strategy. And at the same time, if you're using more and more of your resources for export, that means you have to import what you previously had at home. So it means you get dependent on imports, meaning you need dollars and euros to import food and other consumer goods. Tunisia has the potential to feed itself, for sure. I mean, in antiquity, it was considered North Africa, the breadbasket of Rome. But instead, what we're seeing is much of the land is being used to grow citrus, watermelons, other water-thirsty fruit even less water thirsty olives and dates for exports, mostly to Europe instead. So it can get the money to import food. And this comparative advantage mantra, which really came with the rise of the neoliberal school from the 70s onwards, you know, it doesn't consider shocks like what happened recently with the Russia-Ukraine war, or the fact that developing countries are really far more vulnerable to these kinds of shocks, especially since, you know, they never caught up to developed countries after gaining independence, despite you know, 60, 70 years onwards. So, you know, growing watermelons to get foreign exchange to buy wheat from Ukraine, you know, that sounds a little bit absurd in retrospect, but that's essentially one of the problems you have. So really a crisis of not producing for for domestic markets and an over-reliance on exports, particularly to one market, which is the EU market. Marwa, do you share the same assessment of the longer story, the way that Fadl has, has laid it out? I guess, in other words, I want to hear what your what your sort of assessment is of what Tunisia got wrong in terms of how it handled its economic circumstances since the revolution. I think we inherited an uh, underperforming economy even before the revolution. I mean, I, as I always say, Tunisia's economy has been 
underperforming for years since the 80s mostly. And I think Farad went through that indirectly of how our manufacturing is mostly catering to the outsourcing activities of our commercial partners like European countries in terms of low added value manufacturing, how we left our agriculture unautomated and there are uh, long issues of, of land and I can dig deeper into that in what went wrong in agriculture, what went wrong in manufacturing and what went wrong in, in services. I think what really went wrong or has been going wrong since the revolution is that we have an economy that is stalling. On the one hand, we have business groups that are powerful. And to counter that, we have unions that are powerful. And in between, we have a government that is extremely weak. And it is extremely weak because it lacks credibility. And so we've seen also like scenes of how they, you know, use violence and because they are I mean, these governments were not really able to do things on the economic side or even on the political side. And like we said, we have one of the highest spending on public sector employees and one of the highest number of public sector employees in the world. According to the IMF, it is 17.5% of our GDP and Tunisia is a 40 billion economy. It means that we are spending 7 billion on just the public sector. And, you know, getting through that is just inefficiencies. And at the same time, these business groups, nobody wants to touch them. So we have an economy that is mostly in stagnation. And let me address here the role of the international financial institutions. And that's where I think also I agree with what Fadel said. So to me, these institutions, they work best for us when we work best for ourselves. I mean, they have long history, and like Father mentioned, the the example of World Bank. But we need to address these institutions, and we can have a whole session on this. They have their shortcomings in terms of their ownership and governance structure. I mean, Tunisia is a very teeny tiny minority shareholder in these institutions. We don't have representation on their board, so we cannot decide on what projects to invest in and not to invest in. At the end, they work for themselves. I'm not saying this is wrong or this is or this is right. We say that as Tunisians, as Tunisian government, we need to provide the solutions that we see that are best for us. And for that, we need to reduce information asymmetry. We need to have people that have integrity, that have the political will, and they have the competence to do that and to negotiate well the the terms. And usually these international financial institutions, they take the easy road. For example, since the revolution, what has been the flagship economic reform that, if we can call it reform, that Tunisia did is all these startup. And it is the easy road because nobody wants to touch the business groups. Nobody wants to touch the state-owned enterprises. And so all it's easy to talk, okay, we will, you know, encourage uh, entrepreneurship, we do startups. Tunisia is technology hub for the world, for high-tech, fintech, schmentech. But this is not addressing the fundamentals of the economy and what is wrong with the fundamentals of the economy. So these are red herrings, I think, that benefit no one because by the time we want to see the outcomes of these quote-unquote economic strategy that are just deviating the attention from the real structural issues like we have a poor infrastructure we have key economic vectors that are depleted and inefficient mining tourism agriculture i think father was talking about agriculture and I give this example every time. Beyond the issue of land that can be discussed in depth, but we have small farmers and people that have no power that are squeezed in the middle. People that they control the input prices and then we have output prices that are set by the government. And so we squeeze farmers in the middle. For tourism, we have no strategy, we have no vision. It's just small 
individuals trying to operate in this sector, we know that there are big business groups that are more or less controlling also the services. The mining sector that is, I think, it's one of the pillars of the Tunisian economy. Like if we see how phosphate being extracted, it's just terrible. I mean, it, it doesn't respect minimum safety conditions. It doesn't respect the minimum technology conditions. I mean, these mines are limited in time. Sometimes it's better not to let them function rather than, you know, make them function inefficiently. And especially in today's condition that we are facing issues of food insecurity and food sovereignty crisis, phosphate is one of the hot commodity because, you know, that one of the downstream products of phosphate is fertilizer. So I think things went wrong because we are not focusing on the fundamentals. We are not focusing on dealing with the painful reforms that need political will, that need political confrontation, and that need the government to bring everyone on the table and build consensus. Fado, what can other countries learn from Tunisia's experience as more and more turn to international financial institutions for borrowing to boost their post-pandemic recovery? You know, what can they learn from Tunisia's experience? Yeah, I think it's an important question, particularly as we're seeing maybe some indicators of a repeat of, you know, the vulgar shock, stagflation, some of the sort of debt shock that we saw that uh, unfortunately a lot of African countries particularly suffered from. And I think the economist Fadul Kabu recently put it really succinctly in his last letter to the Financial Times. He said, you know, Africa really needs food and energy sovereignty uh, primarily. And, you know, sovereignty is, is key on this aspect because it won't necessarily work if it's just food security through market mechanisms or trade arrangements. And I'll give you an example because the government has been trying to encourage increased domestic wheat production. You know, this is one key issue that because of the debt, they're seeing a harder time importing wheat, which of course is a very key staple for the diet. And so, you know, you would expect that Tunisia would want to uh, basically produce more wheat at home to be able to, to make sure it's not so vulnerable to something like the Ukraine-Russia war and, and the shocks that we're seeing in the wider commodity sector. Um, but the way that the government has been trying to encourage increased domestic wheat production has been to increase the price it pays to farmers for wheat. So the, the grains office, the Office de Céréales, which has a monopoly basically over buying uh, wheat in Tunisia, they said that they're going to increase the prices this year. And, and they did. They increased the prices almost double. It was a really big increase compared to the, the previous year. But despite this big increase, there was actually less wheat planted this year than last year by a significant amount. So the USDA actually had a report on this on Tunisia this March, and they noted that farmers seeded smaller arm areas due to Tunisia's general economic uncertainty and farmers' unwillingness to take on financial risks. And that's that's part of it. But the other part is that small and medium farmers have really been sidelined in favor of big farmers who export to Europe and bring in foreign currency. They're the ones who get the grants and the assistance from Agence de Promotion des Investissements Agricoles, basically the promotion of agricultural products, an agency dedicated to that under the Ministry of Agriculture. The ones whose phone calls they pick up are usually the big farmers, you know, because the overall strategy really hasn't changed. And that still is about facilitating exports, not necessarily growing food domestically. So like I said, watermelon and citrus for export and then importing wheat. You know, that's really a, a food security logic. Whereas food sovereignty logic says, how do we how do we get more land and people growing food uh, for Tunisians to be able to eat without necessarily being so you know fragile and on the international market when it comes to you know trade or loans or the conditions that come with that. So that's on trade, and then, then the other issue I think that particularly is is important that not only is Tunisia a good example for, but certainly other countries in, in global south can really learn from is. You know, it's related to cutting back on illicit capital flows. You know, the World Bank's chief economist, Penelope Goldberg, she, she left the bank in 2020 when actually there was a report that, that the World Bank didn't publish at the time showing that oftentimes the, the lending from the World Bank ends up in tax havens. And of course, you know, that's part and parcel with the lax rules on capital that, you know, the World Bank historically has encouraged, sort of easy to come in and out to, to sort of drive up foreign direct investment, allow investors to make money and, and then take it out. But you know that's, that's really sort of the same architecture that allows illicit capital flows. 
And I think there's an important UMass Amherst study from 2012 that's showing that actually, you know, four decades of illicit capital flows out of North Africa, you know, in total, they're more than the countries have received in lending during that period. So really, you know, if you want to look at the debt crisis and have a long-term solution to it, you're really going to have to look at cutting back on illicit capital flows and, and ultimately debt uh, cancellation, or at least a haircut are part of that as well. Fadl, by way of closing, I want you to give us some thoughts on how the political actors and what the political actors can do to align, not just on the economy, but also on the country's political future. Yeah, and if, if you don't mind, I'd like to just pick up on, on one thing that Marwa brought up, which is you know the public sector, basically employment. I think it's a very important point to remember that Oftentimes we hear that the spending on public sector as a percentage of GDP is quite high in Tunisia relative to other countries. But uh, as Mahab and Kanta recently pointed out to me, and I think it's a very important point, actually, you know, what we're seeing is GDP per capita in real terms has gone down these last 10 years. So it's not necessarily that public sector spending has, has significantly gone up in the last 10 years. And in fact, there's some areas where you know, for sure, there's there's areas where we, we can say that there's inefficiencies or very serious administrative reforms that are required in the public sector. But certainly when it comes to health and education, we see that actually Tunisia needs a little bit more investment, a little bit more public investment. You know, this is this is really the, the sort of the point that even, you know, the IMF, when they're talking about reform programs saying, you know, we want to have these austerity programs so eventually Tunisia will be able to do public investment, but we haven't seen that. We haven't seen public investment, you know, when you can't get to becoming a developed country when you have hospitals and schools that are falling apart, when you have, you know, 1.3 doctors per thousand people, which we saw at the height of COVID was, uh, you know, a real catastrophe. And that number goes way down once you get outside of the capital. So, so very serious issues that I think need to be addressed before you know you can really imagine maybe a, um, Tunisia doing better economically, politically, socially. You know what it, what it's going to take from from the political class. I think you know at the moment the president seems laser focused right now on getting the constitution that he wants, and the cost of that is so high that he really doesn't can't use any political capital or maybe he doesn't want to on economic issues. So I think, you know, rather than all the steps that he's, he seems to feel he needs to do in terms of consolidating even more power to get his preferred vision when it comes to constitution, electoral reform, you know, just broader sort of changes to the political system in general, I think instead he really needs to refocus his priorities on what is the priorities of everyday Tunisians right now, which is economic challenges. Um, at the same time, I think, you know, the existing institutions and legal structures are, are standing in his way. So, you know, he's, he's, he's going after those, whether it's the, the judges or, or prosecutors that he, he wants them sort of on, on the cases that he wants, maybe even um, perhaps targeting his p- political opponents. Again, you know, I think it'll, it'll take a, a real reprioritization on the economic front and working together with the Ujidite because there's really no way that you'll see significant changes economically unless the key institutional powers in the country, including the UGT, are part of the discussion. Another question that I'd like to get your thoughts on, Marwa, is, you know, there are concerns about Tunisia defaulting, like what happened in Lebanon. What do you think the chances of that happening? Is that likely? And more broadly, what is your take on what Tunisia needs to do to move out of the crisis? Let's set Comparisons aside, I think Lebanon's condition and Tunisia's economic conditions are very different. We have also very different political structures and very different social fabric. We don't have the same ethnic issues or geopolitical issues that Lebanon has. And these types of uh, comparisons to me are not helpful. So let's talk about us. Let's talk about Tunisia. And first, what does default mean? It's just not meeting our our obligations, whether in time or not being able to pay a portion or the total chunk of the debt. Ultimately, we cannot keep borrowing to service our debt, and this is what is happening now. Today, Tunisia is very unlikely to default this year or next year because we have high reserves in foreign currency. We are able to service that debt from them. But if we deplete those resources, then without borrowing more to service the upcoming debt chunks, then yes, we would definitely default. And that's where we need need a solution and we need to act now. 
we need to reduce the debt service overhang for sure. And that by ultimately building a credible business plan, credible to the union, credible to the IMF, and ultimately to the Tunisian economy in the long term. And for that, we need to execute. And execute, we don't need to reinvent the wheel, honestly. For example, we have issues of high unemployment, 18.5% as of recent statistics by, by the World Bank. I mean, that if we do quick math, that is around 1.5 million people. It's not that much. If we just create 10% growth that can be solid vectors like, like tourism or mining or agriculture, that can solve, solve the big issues. So we need to execute, and for that we need to act. We just need to show that there are results. We cannot have paralysis, especially now. And I think this is where now the, this government is, is failing because there is no action, and no action reflects the fear and the lack of political will to change things. Yes, it's good to talk about constitution, but constitution for the sake of, of constitution is not good. We need constitution that serves people. We need laws that protect those who do not have the power, do not have the money, because these big business groups or big powerful groups, they have the capacity to protect themselves. So we need to have people that they have political will, they have no fear, and they can bring people on the table. They are able to build a political and social consensus and engage. Thank you to our guests. It was a pleasure to have you both on. Thank you to our editorial team, Meredith McCreary, particularly, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, and Tisar. Thank you, Fadna. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you, Tisar. Thank you, Marwa. And of course, thank you, Meredith, as well. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.